Welcome to Applications of Deep Neural Networks with PyTorch and Washington University. In this video, we're going to start to actually look at the structure of the neural network that we're going to then code in PyTorch. One of the things that really separates neural networks from other machine learning models, like say a support vector machine, is that the input to the deep neural network is a tensor. So it could be a single value, it could be a 1D array of values, it could be a 2D array of values or a cube or even something that you can't visualize in our three-dimensional space. This allows the neural networks to work particularly well on things like speech, computer vision, and many other types. The input and the output both from the neural network can be a high dimensional tensor. We'll look a lot, at least initially, at regression and classification neural networks. They're both fairly related. It just has to do with how many output neurons you're going to have. If you're going to do regression where you're predicting a number, then you're going to have just one output neuron. Here, and I'm using life insurance examples because that's the industry in which I work, we're putting all these inputs in, and there's some hidden neurons here, and then we're going to output one neuron that specifies the maximum face amount, the most that we would insure this person for based on whatever risk file that we had put into there. Classification neural network is similar, but you're going to sometimes have multiple outputs. If you're just doing binary classification, classifying between two things, it looks really relatively similar to a regression neural network. You're just going to have a, a single output neuron and that output neuron, you're probably going to use a, a logit or something to bound it into zero to one for that prediction, but it's very, the rest of the neural network is really pretty similarly structured. If you have multiple, like here we have multiple classes, we are going to assign one output neuron per each of the classes. The highest one wins, basically. You might use something like a softmax, which we'll see in a moment, that will cause the sum of these four to be one. And that makes it easier to think of in terms of probabilities. So you hear a lot about neurons and layers. Layers are groups of neurons that are fairly similarly connected. Most neural network libraries, like PyTorch, TensorFlow is the same way, you typically have one individual object for a layer. And you think of things in terms of layers. Rarely are you defining the individual neurons. Your input neurons almost aren't really neurons. They're sort of placeholders. If you're sending in a vector of size three, then you're going to have three input neurons. And each of these connections are going to go to a neuron in the next layer. And this neuron, you can really think of it as a summation. It is taking the inputs, the weighted inputs, and summing them together, running that through an activation function, which gives it nonlinearity so that you can deal with things that don't just line up in a straight regression line, then the output. So this is your most simple construct that you will see when dealing with these neural networks. Weight, weighted input going into a summation, going then into an activation function, and then to the output. The function looks something like this. You have the inputs being the x. That is the input vector tensor, basically, that is going into the neural network. The weights for this particular layer. And then the output of that, let's start in the center, theta, which represents the weights. These are the things that change as you fit the neural network to the problem. And then the inputs that were passed into it. You're going to sum all of those together, and then you're going to pass that whole thing into the activation function. This entire thing is differentiable, so you are able to use gradient descent to optimize theta, the weights. It's just slightly more complicated than that. There is a bias connection. It can be thought of just as the other weights. So in this one up here, you could think of maybe input one and input two are the actual weights, the actual inputs that you're passing in. And then input three would always be one, which would cause the weight three to always be simply added to 
this summation. You can think of the bias neuron as similar to the intercept, like in slope intercept form, y equals mx plus k form that you might have seen in algebra. So consider if you were passing one and two in, you would append a one onto the end of that vector to represent the bias. The bias is always one. I've never seen a case where you would make it not. We're gonna use these weights. So 0 0.1 is the first weight, 0 0.2 is the second weight, 0 0.3 is the bias value, the intercept. We multiply these inputs by each of these. So 0 0.1 times one, 0 0.2 times two. The, the bias is really meant to be added, just like y equals mx plus k. Here, we can create more complex structures. Most neural not networks would not be structured this way, but you can certainly build them in PyTorch. So here we have the input one and the input two going into neuron one, input three and input four going into neuron two. Then neuron three takes these two and then uh, puts it to the activation function. You have the output. I'm not showing the biases here just for simplicity. Usually what you would see is input one, two, three, and four would all connect into uh, network neuron one, and then input one, two, three, four would all connect into two. So you have one complete set of weights for each. This is a type of neural network that you will see sometimes set up to emulate functions like and, or, exclusive, or. This is what most of the neural networks will look like in this class. You're gonna have one, two, three, four, and you can see you can think of four as being the bias, so that would be a one. And then one, two, three are the actual inputs. And then they would go densely connected, dense layers, into the next layer, and then densely connected to the next layer, and then finally to the output layer. They're not always dense. We'll see cases where you can do skip layers and also where you can prune. You'll have multiple types of neurons. You have the input neurons, which are really just placeholders. You have the hidden neurons, which is every neuron, every layer, hidden layer, in between the input layer and the output layer. Output neurons, those are the ones at the very, very end. Again, not they are more like traditional neurons than the inputs because they are actually doing summations from what comes before them. And then the bias neurons. You place a bias neuron on every single layer except for the output. Every single one of these kind of layers anyway. Then you have the input layer, output layer, hidden layer, denoted by which type of neurons were there. Again, the input to the neural network is typically a vector or a higher dimension tensor. This is what a full two input neural network might look like with all the biases. There's two hidden layers, one input layer and one output layer. And you can see they're dense layers, they're all connected. Huh, that should have an arrow there. So why do we need those bias neurons? They are the intercept. So if you take the sigmoid function here, which is a common activation function, and we pass into it the weights and the, the, the biases, and we vary, as we vary the weight between these values, the output is going to change. But notice where it intercepts stays the same. You're only adjusting the slope by adjusting the weight. If you adjust the bias neuron input between these values, then you can see that you're shifting it back and forth. They all converge to largely the same thing, given, I mean, that's the way the sigmoid works. But using those two parameters together, you can really adjust the, the overall curvature because you can shift back and forth with the bias and you can adjust the slope with the weight. Activation functions become very important because they are what puts that nonlinearity into there. Without the activation function, this would be straight. The linear activation function is the most simple. It's just straight. This is usually the output layer of a regression neural network. Rectified linear unit is one of the advances that really helped deep learning get past the vanishing gradient problem. The vanishing gradient problem, when we get into training, we'll see more about that, but that has to do with saturation when these, these go near zero. That can cause many of the neurons to drop out of training and become just, just simply not used. The rectified linear unit is pretty simple. It's largely a linear function past zero and then flattens out before zero. There's also the leaky ReLU, which we will see as well. Rectified linear unit activation functions are very, very commonly used on the hidden layers.
softmax activation function. This is commonly used on the output layers of a classification neural network. What it's going to do is take each of those values, like you might be training a neural network that classifies between three different values in the, in the iris data set. The iris data set gives you four measurements for each iris to classify them into three different classes. And here, the output neurons, well, you can see that neuron one, one, it's, it's going to definitely be a Satosa flower. These other two are there as well. You might like for these to sum to one. And that is what the soft max and you can see here where I took it manually through the calculation, like I show you down here, that is what it comes up with. Step activation function is used sometimes when you just want to toggle past a value. So here, anything below zero is going to be zero. Anything above zero is going to be, is going to be one. Sigmoid activation function, we saw that. That was used a lot more in classic neural networks, but you do, you do see it. It's, it's sometimes used as the output from a binary classification as the logit. And then you also have the tangent, hyperbolic tangent. Both of these look pretty similar. They're kind of S-shaped. Tangents maybe a little bit a little bit steeper. The important thing is the 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 H the hi, hyperbolic tangent is going between negative one and one. The sigmoid is going between zero and one. And by the way, hyperbolic tangent has its own use in trigonometry, has nothing to do with why it's being used here. It's, it's chosen because of its shape and because it's commonly calculated by most math libraries. Now, why is the rectified linear unit so valuable? Because we're using gradient descent to optimize the neural network. So the weight, you have to optimize the weight sort of one at a time per, per step or per epoch as, as you before you uh, update the weights. And if you were to calculate the error of the neural network, so what is the difference in value between what it output and what it should have outputted, and you plot this as a function as you change the weight. So as you change the weight, okay, here the error is getting worse, 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 here the error is getting better, 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 and so on. You would have to try all kinds of weights. And remember, these are floating points, so the density property applies here. There, there's infinite values here. We don't get to visualize this whole thing at once. We could, but that would make training very, very slow. We just know what the error was at the current weights. If we take the derivative, the gradient here, it's going to give us essentially a slope. So the value that is tangent to the error curve at that point. And this tells you what you should do with the weights. So the slope of this line is negative. Negative means you should add to the weight. If it was a positively sloped line, then you should subtract one from the weight to get to a better value for that weight. Now this is why you tend to run into local minima because if you're just adjusting this slowly, slowly, slowly based on the weight, you're gonna get stuck right here. And who knows, just beyond this, there might actually be a better weight, but you're gonna be stuck down here in the local minima. And here you can see at the sigmoid, the derivative tends to go to zero at the extreme ends of this, and that leads to the vanishing gradient problem. Whereas the derivative of the rectified linear unit doesn't just get trapped in that zero range. Thanks for watching this video and please like and subscribe and click the bell icon so that you don't miss anything in this course. And thank you to all the Patreon and YouTube members for your support. It's very much appreciated.